the Clyde Broadcast Podcast, bringing to you inspiring broadcast stories and the latest in broadcast technology. I'm with a very special guest. Um, I thought to myself, what would be the right way to introduce the person in front of me? And I thought I have to do this properly. So, you know, I've, I've, I've written something that you may be familiar with. This is official. I, I know I have to do this. I mean, we're going to lean back after this, but <laughs> my guest is Eugenia Abu, a Nigerian, legendary Nigerian broadcast journalist, writer, poet, media consultant, and best known as a former news anchor and correspondent for the Nigerian Television Authority. She's considered, and I dare say, like, top two, she's not number two, one of Nigeria's finest broadcasters and compares. She anchored the very famous 9 p.m. news on the NTA network for 17 years. Totally insane. I want everybody here to put our hands together for you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, your, your stories, I mean, we shared some stories before, you know, we got into this. Yes, um, you, absolutely. You're just an amazing storyteller. Um, <laughs> when, when did you know you could tell stories and how did that lead you into a life in journalism? Okay, um, my grandfather, my mother's father, yeah. um, was an amazing storyteller. And I would sit at his feet for many years. I met him before he passed. Yeah. And, you know, um, he considered me a very curious child. So he always had interesting stories um, to tell me. He was a merchant. Yeah. So he sold fabric from, yeah. from Okene, where they make um, woven fabrics. And he would travel um, across Nigeria to sell, particularly in the East. And he had, he regaled me with stories of how Sometimes they walked and sometimes they went on bicycles for months. And then he came back fairly wealthy. And so he was well known as the man who built um, um, a story building um, after royalty. So um, the royal um, um, head of Okene had um, a story building and my grandfather was the next person with it. Wow. So that's, you know, pretty interesting. That's amazing. Yes. So you started your career storytelling, uh, not Behind the mic, not unlike this one. Right. Uh, but when did you know that you had to go do that? Um, actually, I became, um, well, a storyteller I became before I became a broadcaster because I started writing stories when I was seven. And I loved the library, my father's library. So I was the one who would stand on um, a ladder and try to bring down Encyclopedia Britannica, huge books, some of which, um, when I read, I couldn't tell what the words were, um, so huge above my head. So my father would buy a dictionary and put it beside me. And then I can run up to him and say, what does this word mean? So I was reading things way beyond my years when I was young. And at seven, I started to scribble. Insect men and women, long legs, stick legs, matchbox legs. And I had characters for every um, drawing. And so I would, my father would come back from work and he encouraged me by leaving lots of papers in the house, plain, allowing me to write and draw as much as I wanted. And then when he came back, he would ask me how was Mary, one of the characters. Oh, yeah. Did she have an accident today? Um, um, so who looked after her? Did she go to hospital? What about her brother? And so I created all these characters and my father was my muse. So I would go to him to tell him the tale and he would encourage me to write some more. So that's when I knew. But broadcasting came to me by accident. I literally was waiting to go into the university. I was 17, 16 and a half. And I started hearing a radio station running, um, what do you call it? When you're doing... Um, uh, no, when they were doing test transmission. And I was intrigued by it and asked my dad if I could go take a look. That was the beginning of my journey. I walked in there and the gentleman says, have you auditioned? I said, what's that? He put, stuck me in the studio and said, say something, read something. And then I was hired as a vacation jobber. And throughout my university days, I went back to Radio Bainway as a vacation jobber every two, three months. And that's where the story started. Then I did youth service at OGBC at Bilkuta. There it is. Oh, dear. And then your legendary time at the NT. I mean, that's... That's a pinnacle of broadcasting in Nigeria. Uh, and then you were there for 17 years, but you weren't just doing some 2 p.m. news or three in the afternoon. It yeah. was everybody sat down in, in, in millions of households across the country right. uh, to watch you bring them the story of the day, the stories of the day. Mm. Was there any time you felt some sort of pressure going into that seat when the cameras would come on? Right. Well, I mean, I started in NTA Makwadi. 
um, where I lived for 10 years. So my, basically my career in television started NTA Makodi. I was headhunted by the general manager NTA Makodi, engineer Isaac Wakumbo. Um, I'd just come back from youth service from OGBC. And when I arrived, I was working with the Ministry of Information State. My father was working in the civil service. Um, and so when NTA came knocking and said, would you like to work with NTA? I had started a program called Benue State Government Half Hour on the State Ministry of Information, which NTA Makudi supported. And then the general manager thought, well, she looked like somebody who could, you know, because I went to make a suggestion to my director that we couldn't just be sending news letters around. Nobody was reading them. I said, could we do a TV program? He says, oh, yeah, why not? And then I said, when are we starting? He said, well, you go do a production. I'm like, what's that? And then he goes, you've worked in radio before. Translate it to TV and go and do as a production. So I said, who's the presenter? He said, you, of course. I said, me? I've never done anything on TV. He said, you'll try. And from there, NTA picked me up. So I worked in NTA marketing for 10 years before I hit the network service. And so I've had practice. But even then, you had to be polished. So I arrived in headquarters, and I read the 2 p.m., noon, 7 p.m., for people to see if I've got what it takes to enter the big league. And after about two or so months of polish, I then hit the big league. It was, I was very, it was nerve wracking that the whole world outside Nigeria, where we could be seen um, in London and the US could see me. It was a bit, uh, it, it could be heavy. Um, but over time I learned to breathe. I learned to polish my craft, do it the best way I can. And then we were, we were the only business in town at the time. And so everybody kind of like watched us. Uh, I look back and I think if there was competition, would we have been so well known? Um, but then that's a story for another day. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're made for that time. <laughs> yes, I agree. And you've evolved through the years uh, to this time. Absolutely. Now. We're going to talk about you know, what you got coming up. But I also want to know is, I'm sure when you go back, you see the videos from, from, from the past and you hear all the tales and people tell you where they were, where, how they know you. How do you feel when you watch yourself? I don't watch myself. You don't? No. While you were, you know, actively broadcasting, I didn't watch myself. Did you? No. Why did you avoid doing that? Well, I had my colleague Tokumba Ajay, who who would always go back to see if she had made any gaffes. Yeah. The late Tokumba Ajay, and 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 she famously watched herself. I, I find, and I'm sure if you asked people who um, uh, work on television, some of them are pretty much like me. You get a bit embarrassed watching yourself, so it, it's a bit unnerving. I, I find it difficult to to look at my own image, you know. Not 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 because there was anything wrong with doing that. I just just never did. I just that really fascinating. Yes, it is amazing. I couldn't bring myself to watch it. I just thought it was a bit you know self entitled and I just simply didn't. My my personal thoughts. Yes. Mm. No, I, I mean I get it. I'm just I'm just fascinated because it's like hundreds of hours or millions of hours of you on television. Like never watched years. Never, never watched. watched it. Mm. Wow. Um, would you it's a bit different now because I, I do what they call celebrity anchoring for Trust TV, okay. a channel that you can see on Star Times. And they, they then post it on Instagram and I stumble in it, on it. It's, it te technology has driven the fact that you don't go to sit somewhere to watch it. Yeah. Now I can actually run into it and say to my family members, who is this, please? <laughs> there you go. And, and fan encounters. I can, I can say you've had so many. I'm having one at the moment here. Mm. Um, how do those make you feel when people give you such really great reviews of your work over the years and how it's impacted them? I'm, I'm truly thankful for those. Um, it, it is humbling. And every day I bump into people two days ago, and this happens routinely now, yeah. when I take the Uber and the person recognizes me, then he goes, you can't pay. <laughs> You've served your nation, madam. I'm like, no, this is a business. Please allow me. Please, madam, could you just allow me to do the honors? You can't pay. So it's truly humbling when you run into people who say, thank you for all you do. And you're thinking, I just did my work. But it is something to be grateful for. And truly, I'm thankful to all those fans of mine who say this all the time, who meet me and never stop. And I'm wondering, how come they still remember? It's been eons of years ago. Yeah, there's there's a, something to be said about that work. I think you're iconic. I thank you. And I, we just need to look at the sort of impact that you've done in people's lives personally, but also, I think, in the life of the country. And as a broadcaster, you come across so many news stories, I'm sure. Um, but are, are there any ones that you can remember then that you thought to yourself after the fact that, oh my, I was a part of such an impactful moment? Just the aftermath of that. Pieces of history. Yeah. I've been the one who announced the passing of Aminu Kanu, who was legendary. 
as a PRP um, um, funds person. I happen to have been the one, and I don't know how this happens to me, that announced the passing of MKO Abiola. And then all networks across the world then started to play me yeah. saying these things. Uh, I happen to have been the one, having flown back and forth from Lagos to Abuja and back to Abuja on the same day um, to announce that there had been a Bellevue crash. My uncle is an airline pilot, and when I spoke to him, when it happened, he said to me, um, first we started by saying the plane had disappeared. They couldn't find it. We couldn't see it on the radar. Aviation sources said it was missing. And my uncle says a plane is never missing. It's either been hijacked or it has crashed. And as we found out a couple of days later, it had in fact crashed. So these, being a harbinger of such huge, momentous occasions in our lifetime um, has, has given me thoughts to reflect from time to time about how I happen to be the one. It's amazing. But I've also been having of good news as well, sir. Yes, I, I, loads of them. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> sure. And let's look at what broadcasting is, is, has evolved into now right. in 2023, well, right. Africa 2023. I'm sure you've gone around the floor. Yes. So, so many changes in technology now. Yeah. What's some of the ones that excite you? I'm pretty much excited by the fact that you can share content. I'm excited by the fact that you can take content wherever you want to go on the platforms now make it um, uh, make you able to be on the move while you do content. Gaming has changed a lot of things. Um, AI is, is making stuff a bit uh, interesting, more interesting than it has ever been. ChatGPT is doing a lot of things that, yes, as an, as, as, as an academic now, um, going to school and doing my PhD, I find that people can take slews of information and just plaster it. And so now plagiarism is a big deal. Fake news is a big deal. So you worry about those. You worry about the fact that you can actually make um, equipment for just killing thousands of people just using AI. And when you think about it, it's crazy. But you also think about what can AI do, robotics. And, and so technology comes on both sides of the divide, the pluses and the negatives. I'm excited about the fact that somebody can actually check your work and see if you copied someone else. I'm excited about the fact that you can be somewhere else and talk to someone else, um, and you can see the person. These are things that never happened when we were growing up. We had black and white TV. Can you imagine just how much you can do now with technology? Yeah. It's incredible. Yes. This is slightly detail sort of from your professional life and career. I, I want to go into a bit of, um, I'd say, deliberate parenting. And you mentioned earlier about how your dad influenced your storytelling. Yes, encouraged you. absolutely. Yeah. I happen to know some of your children. Um, I know I play your, your, your children's music on the yes. radio station. Yeah. Oh, is that me? Yes. You're very famous. <laughs> uh, you just uh, mentioned your other daughter, Chide, who's also an artist. She does fantastic work. Right. Uh, in, in, as a parent now, what are some of the lessons you picked up from your dad and you're using to encourage your kids in their expressions? I think it's important to allow the children to flower. Mm. What I found when I started the Treasured Writers um, 15 years ago in Abuja was that there were summer camps where they taught the kids the same things. Children don't want to listen to mathematics teachers anymore. They don't want to have an English teacher. They, they don't want to do what they did in school. So we teach what schools don't teach. And because I couldn't find a boot camp a summer camp for my children that teaches that, mm -hmm. I started one. That's great. Yes. And then I invited their friends to join. Yeah. And that's how the Treasured Writer started. Because if you teach children, if you put them around creativity, they'll flower. Mm -hmm. And so basically I taught writing. I taught imagination. I took you to motherless babies' homes to see just how privileged you were. I took them to um, places where they could observe. So you'll find kids can come out and observe. We're in a park. And you say, go and see how many trees you have. And some kids say four. There are ten. Some kids say ten. So to be a keen observer will make you a creative. And my house is full of books. Fantastic. My father had lots of books, and I thought it was deliberate. I had lots of books around my house. So my kids became whatever they wanted to be, and some more. Mm. Uh, so the twins are graduates of one graduated textile design, um, uh, uh, did um, uh, her, her, her BA in industrial design in Zaria. The other graduated BA theater and perform, performing arts, and they're singers. Yes. Chide is an architect, but she's a painter. Yeah. Look at that. So, you know, I, my son is did chemical engineering, but he's a cocktail mixer. So these things are things that are dynamics for parents to understand that these kids have three different lives, and you must, you must water each of them. And, and so it was intentional for me to allow them grow in the direction. If I find that you could do something, I put you in a place where you could learn more. Um, 
during the, the strike by A.B. Uzaria, my last daughter, yes. who is also an artist, a portraitist, um, I sent her over to a studio where they did photography, and she became the best there. So during the seven months, she was learning. Her. Now she's a portrait photographer. So we've bought her some equipment where our money can take us. Her savings has bought a few lights yeah. and all of that. So you need to put the kids close to things you think they are interested in and leave the rest for nature. That's brilliant. And thank you. I think a lot of you can pick up lessons for that. Just one more thing. Right. I know yeah, you, you're not retired. Uh, you, you still tell really good stories. And I know, I know this this setup excites you. I can see just absolutely. Really, absolutely. What's next for you? Well, I'm a very um, keen person about my writing. I have two books. Um, Don't Look at Me Like That, a collection of poems. And In the Blink of an Eye, an award-winning collection of essays. I, I write for newspapers. I'm a columnist with Business Day. And I was a columnist, um, or a feature writer for the Guardian newspapers, and a columnist on books for trust um, newspapers. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting together um, two books. One of it is on encounters. Yeah. And the second one is how to be better. How to be a better person from different nuggets and stories over the years. So books coming up. Um, the next thing is I'm trying to see how I can finish my PhD. It's very, very stressful, but very exciting. Yes. And then I'm hoping to start a podcast. So you will start. Uh, I'm, I, I so want to start a podcast. Yes. So, um, and I'm doing interviews with iconic persons across the world. But Mali's wife lives in Ghana. Yeah. In a short while, I'll be in Ghana to speak with her. Uh, Mayata Fambuli, Liberia's finest musician, now 75, lives in Ghana. So when I do Accra, I'll stop by to speak with them. And hopefully I'll do a couple of heads of states. Fantastic. I am looking forward to everything you bring to us yes. next. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.